Today we're going to get hold of four bottles of metaphorical champagne and smash them in celebration across the bows of four first books by young writers. A collection of very funny personal essays, two very different first novels, and a memoir. The title page for this program reads, You Always Remember the First Time. Today we have with us Sloane Crosley, who has written a very funny book of personal essays called I Was Told There'd Be Cake. She's going to explain to us what that means, among many other things. Keith Gesson, a first novel, very interesting and different kind of first novel. A book called All the Sad Young Literary Men, and I hope he's going to tell us why they're all so sad. Julie Clam has written a memoir called Please Excuse My Daughter, and we'll find out what she needs to be excused for, among other things. And Caridwin Dovey has written a first novel called Blood Kin, which is about a coup in a nameless country. Sloan. Yes. I was told there'd be cake. It, in, it indicates a certain kind of disappointment. Yes, it indeed does. You think it kind of goes through the book in some ways? I think it does. I think, I don't know if it was, um, I think there's a, a pressure that a lot of essay collections have to have a massive theme to them um, and something really distinctive. Uh, there's no, you know, I thought about having maybe like a turtle crawl through all the essays randomly, but that didn't quite seem like a very selling theme, or nor did it seem true. <laughs> so it's your second book. <laughs> it's my second book, The Turtle Chronicles. But um, for the first one, um, I think it's just about uh, the sort of general coming age of age sort of stories that uh, most essays really are, sort of something has to happen, there has to be some sort of catalyst and some kind of, sometimes it changes, sometimes it stays the same, but in general, um, yeah, it's about disappointment, it's about going to it's things with one idea, yeah. and yeah. But it's funny. I hope. It is very funny. <laughs> um, there's a point at which in one of the pieces you seem to have 50 toy ponies in an oven. They're not in an oven. That would be a fire hazard. Um, they're in a kitchen drawer. <laughs> oh, I misread it. I was hoping they were in the oven. I mean, they're not. Horse meat so stew. Like, yeah, like that. it's a <laughs> terrible <laughs> twisted fairy tale, which is, I guess, not unlike what actually happens, which is that um, uh, I, for a while, had sort of worked into my speech this sort of expression I would use all the time or sort of reference I would make all the time of referencing plastic ponies. Um, Will there be ponies at a party? If something's supposed to be fun, people say, can I get you anything? I usually respond, a pony. Um, and apparently it had sort of unconsciously become so commonplace that I would go on, um, you know, occasional dates with people and uh, I would make the reference on the first date and by the second date, very often I would then get a plastic pony because that's funny for them. I didn't know there were suitors who they listened had no so closely. Idea. They do. They're really good. They're only <laughs> they, in New York. They're only in New York. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, anyway, so I, I developed, and I make it sound like this happened over a short period of time. I assure you, this is a long period of time. These dates were not frequent. Um, and I developed this drawer full of plastic toy ponies, uh, which I realized was unhealthy. Um, not a fire hazard, but unhealthy enough. And so I set about getting rid of them. What happened was, um, is that I couldn't figure out how to get rid of them. I didn't want to melt them because they sort of meant too much to me and also that would smell really terrible. Um, and like burnt hair, I would imagine. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to give them away. Uh, they had too much sort of bad karma. And so at the end of the day, I decided that I would just, I just needed them away from me. So I scooped them up, put them in a plastic bag and decided that it would be very poetic to leave them on a subway train, right? which I did. And then I left the train and realized that I had left. I mean, it was a black bag. The least I could have done was put it in, <laughs> put it in <laughs> Ziploc, you know, a series of Ziploc bags or uh, something labeled ponies, not a national threat. <laughs> so. Well, I wonder if that would have really helped because then they'd think they were explosive ponies. I mean, they would be just almost <laughs> as bad. That's true. Exploding ponies is, is a really big <laughs> issue in this day and age. <laughs> so let's talk about some other sort of along the lines of disappointments. There was, um, there's a funny theme in your book about Jewishness, especially with regard to Christmas. Um, you call yourself a bad Jew or a lax Jew, as I recall, or your family. Can you, is there 
Well, we don't have a huge amount of traditions in our family. I mean, the closest we come is that a lot of us have Siamese cats. Um, that's not really quite... I mean, it's Egyptian, I guess, technically, but it's not really quite the same thing as having a solid religion. Um, you don't worship Ra the sun god, or no? <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> <laughs> aside from that. But um, we, my father grew up actually very Jewish, um, and he grew up around Brighton Beach. And my mother grew up kind of mixed, but also Jewish. So usually when people find out that I do have a Christmas tree or grew up with one, they assume that one of my parents is not Jewish. Um, but the whole thing about being a lax Jew is that there's this weird sort of language implication that I was at one point, you know, a very fervent, you know, sort of temple-going Jewish person, and now I'm not, when you're in fact I never was. You've fallen away. Exactly. Like and so I think that particular essay you're referring to is sort of about me, you know, kind of reclaiming the fact that I am allowed to, you know, be religious, even if it's sort of on my own terms. There's another um, kind of feeling of disappointment. I want to just read one, one thing here that really got my attention. And it's very um, minor. And it kind of addresses the offloading of the ponies. And it addresses, in some, in some ineffable way, the Jewishness. And it says here, it talks about, um, uh, in, the, in the section about being a uh, maid of honor, I think, Right. Does it, am I wrong? Am I thinking that's the essay that says I could never keep invisible girlfriends, never mind the solid kind? <laughs> what does that mean? I mean, um, well, just to contextualize it okay. briefly, okay. <laughs> um, I was sort of uh, asked to be suckered, if you will, um, in a wedding of a woman I haven't spoken to in a very long time, and so I. A lot of that essay is really not about weddings. It's really actually about sort of female friendships. And I have very good, close, personal female friends on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but large masses of them I found difficult, sort of like a poorly executed chemistry experiment. And the invisible kind refers to, um, so that's the solid kind not working. Um, and the invisible kind refers to an uh, essay further back in the collection um, about me trying to have an invisible friend and having sort of the same problem, which is that I knew I was supposed to have an invisible friend. So I named her, and then I would abandon what her, her everywhere. Name? What was her name again? Oh, Kim? Kim. I'm right. going to go <laughs> for the win no, that's right. for Center Square <laughs> you, is Kim. You, right. um, but right. that's a testament to how poorly I treated her, really. Mm. I just, so anyway, so I did, I, I have had difficulty with Again, that sort of touches, I guess, on the disappointment idea that I realized you're probably supposed to have some sort of en masse group of right. girlfriends, and what, I have them in one. Do these various kinds of difficulties growing up, challenges, shall we say, moments of transition, as they say in corporate life, do they, uh, are they what led you t to write the book? I mean, what sort of gave you the nerve, mm -hmm. shall we say, to, it's to do this? It's kind of nervy. It is, yeah. to think that anyone will care. <laughs> Uh, well, they I, will. I hope. <laughs> well, that's part of it. Um, I think what happened, the story sort of behind the book's existence period is actually very specific, which I think is rare when you're writing a book, you know, mm -hmm. to actually be able to trace the germ of it. But what happened was I would locked myself out of two different apartments while moving in Manhattan in the same day, which is sort of a phenomenal feat of idiocy. And uh, the same locksmith had come to uh, rescue me in an eight hour, he worked long days, I guess, in an eight hour time span. Anyway, I wrote a very long email about it, um, which I know is not the highest literary form, and I assure you I had aspired to others before email, but um, one of the people, the recipients of the email was an editor at the Village Voice who I was friendly with, and he said if I cleaned it up and wrote a new introduction, he would print it, which he did, and so then I started writing, and that's when the voice came afterwards. Here um, we are. Well, it's long it's answer uh, to your question. no, no, it's fine, and I because we have um, four young writers here today, and it's interesting to me that um, that you all have started out sort of fairly early on, especially with memoir or personal essays. But you you pull it off beautifully. It's Thank it's you. great. <laughs> Keith, I was talking with um, Sloan about disappointments, sadnesses, and the name of your novel is All the Sad Young Literary Men. What I'm wondering about is whence the sadness. The young men are sad because uh, 
life has has not lived up to their expectations. Um, <clears throat> they know a lot of stuff. Uh, they know a lot of stuff about history and politics and literature, and their lives are uh, are not like the lives that they've studied. Um, and they, you know, they they find that all the things that they've studied um, are not particularly useful uh, in figuring out their own lives, um, particularly in figuring out uh, women and, and, and how to make women love them. This is a constant theme in the book. That yes. They know a lot of scholarly and historical stuff, but they keep on getting sort of messed up when they deal with their own personal lives. Um, they seem to understand that disjunction between their knowledge and their personal difficulties. Yes, and and you know, and I and I think um, it was important for me for them to be uh, to do ridiculous things, but not be ridiculous people. Um, and I think you know, when you talk about a sort of person who knows a lot of stuff and has studied a lot of stuff, um, traditionally, or or. In a lot of the books that I read, these people are just eggheads, and they're just fools. Um, but in fact, if you know a lot of stuff, it, it could help you uh, navigate some things in life. And um, it'll take you a, a certain part of the way. So to know that uh, you know, the Mensheviks, uh, they left the, uh, the Soviet uh, in, uh, on the night of October 25th during the revolution, you know, that, it's going <laughs> to help you uh, at certain <coughs> points in life. Um, at certain other points, you're just going to have to kind of go off on your own. Right. When there's a revolution, you, you'll know, <laughs> stick exactly. around. You'll, yeah, you'll stick know around, what to yeah. do. The, 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 the women seem to be somewhat puzzled by the men. And is this something, I mean, I'm just wondering whether you, find, whether you think that, that the, the romantic life and erotic life of people simply is totally, has to be totally separate from, from political ideals and history? Well, uh, no, no. Uh, they seem to run into each other. Sam cares very much about the Palestinian-Israeli problem, but it doesn't stand in very good stead, particularly with his personal. It seems almost as if they're in conflict. Well, actually, I mean, actually, if Sam could just make up his mind, uh, you know, in the, in the first Sam story, there's uh, these two women, and uh, one of the women is dovish on Israel, and the other is very hawkish. And if and Sam is just not sure, and if he could just become a Israel hawk then he would live happily ever after with Talia. Mm -hmm. um, and if he could just become a, a peacenik, he would live happily ever after with, with Ariel. And so actually, uh, you know, it's the same problem. It's extraordinary because the book seems to posit that these political positions of these guys really do matter in some ultimate way in their personal relationships that they, just as you've explained. Um, and uh, that's an unusual take for a novel these days. It's outside of the normal um, or the maybe expectable uh, boy-girl sex in the city kind of thing. You have a whole context for it. And you well, meant that. Sorry? You meant that. Y yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think the things that we, we think and that we believe are not simply extraneous things to our lives that have nothing to do with our personal relations. Um, and if, if you end up with someone who doesn't believe in the things that you believe, that's a, that's a problem. Except um, for my mother-in-law and father-in-law. <laughs> my mother-in-law is a Republican, my father-in-law is a Democrat, and they've been married for 60 years, so. It, it happens. <laughs> maybe it's true that they're not so far. Yeah, may, no, maybe, <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe that's my problem. Right. Uh, maybe that's the problem that these guys have, is that they want, in fact, their lives to, and everything in their lives to, to be part of their belief system, and that that's impossible. There's a character, one of the characters' names is Keith, strangely yes. enough. And oddly, uh, and one can, well, not oddly, but one can expect that it wasn't chosen at random. Can, can we talk a little bit about the kind of age-old, somewhat maybe tiresome story, except maybe not in this case, of autobiography and fiction and what the relation is, for instance, between Keith and you? Sure. Um, for... Uh, Keith is probably the character who's least like me. Um, <laughs> of course. Uh, and although biographically, he's most like me. So, so um, a lot of, uh, what I mean in terms of just his background. Um, and, you know, what was interesting about 
having writing fiction that's autobiographical is that you can um, you can use the the tools of fiction and and uh, fictional things happen. I mean, most of the stuff in the book never happened, <laughs> um, although most of the people in the book exist. So it's uh, it's fictional things that happen to non-fictional people. Um, and with Keith, it was uh, you know I started writing. It, he wasn't always Keith, uh, but I I did start to write. Um, two of the guys were written in the third person, Mark and Sam. And then uh, this third one, I started writing in the first person. And I thought, well, God, people are just going to think it's me. Because <laughs> uh, right. it's written in the first person. And p readers just can't help it. Uh, and I can't help it when I'm a reader. Um, and I thought, fine, let this person just be named Keith. And if, you know, if people really want to think that, that's fine. But, it, but in, in terms of um, most of the people who, who know me actually associate me with the one of the different, a different guy. Well, different yeah. guy. <laughs> um, there's a passage here that um, caught my eye. It's very powerful and it gives us a very short sense of what the writing is like. Um, but also ha it raises a question. Um, Keith, in speaking of Keith, says, when you're 20 years old and 21 and 22 and 23 and 24, what you want from people is that they tell you about you. Then it says, when you're 20, and 21, 22, 23, you watch the world for the way it watches you. Do people laugh when you make a joke? Do they kiss you when you lean into them at a party? This, does it change? Oh, uh, I think so. I think, I think you, um, I think you, I don't know if you figure out who you are, but you just kind of historically, <laughs> uh, you, you think, well, I've done these things over and over and over, and it seems to be that's what I'm going to do. Um, and so in that sense, you figure out who you are, and then um, people can like it or, or not like it. Um, and, and so it's less, so your relations with people are, I guess I've found that my relations with people are less about um, uh, what, they, what they will tell me about me and, and more, you know, what they're just, what's interesting about them. Yeah. But the dedication page to your book, I believe says with apologies to my friends. Oh, I changed that. Actually. Oh, you have changed it, <laughs> but they they do deserve well, apologies. It will, yes, it will live forever now on the yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the pirate. Why gathers. had it been there? Oh, um, you know, there's uh, well, it, all the people. I think a lot of people recognize themselves, and then I did things to them that uh, I put them in situations that they'd never been in. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> I had uh, I had one one of the women in the book. Um, I said, "Will you read this?" You know, because some people are giving me a hard time. And uh, she read it. She read it, and she's uh, you know she would sort of send me text messages as she was reading it, saying, "Oh, it's it's not so bad. I don't know what everybody's so mad at you for." And then she got to herself, and uh, she <laughs> she sent me much angrier uh, text messages. And we talked, and she said, "This book will ruin your life." Ruin your life. Wow. Yeah. I, I think she was just mad at me. I don't think it will. <laughs> that sounds like it came from a place um, of anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that was her judgment. About graduate school, you say, what a sad place was graduate school. And on Friday nights, these attempts at human togetherness, and yet with the collapse of the discipline of history into Antiques Roadshow, and then you go on. Just talk about Antiques Roadshow. That's a fascinating thing, the collapse of history into Antiques Roadshow. Wonderful, but I'm not sure I know what it means. Oh, I, I, uh, it seems like in the past, uh, you know, decade, there's just been a lot of. Uh, and again, I'm, a, I come at this. I have a sort of literary background, um, and I didn't go to graduate school in history. And I'm uh, extrapolating a bit about what's going on in literary studies to what's going on in what I imagine is going on in historical studies. Although I see some of this, and you, you get a lot of, you get a history of the, uh, the pencil. You know, right. history of salt. Um, <laughs> so the idea that uh, you know the world is made up of these little objects, and these little objects each have a story, <laughs> um, and uh, that there isn't that we couldn't actually tell a big story, right, about anything other than these little tiny objects. Right. Um, and uh, so you know that character in particular, uh, and I share this with him, uh, is he's a, a socialist, <laughs> um, and you know he wants to have large explanations of everything that's going on as opposed to. On the other hand, um, sometimes history is in one single life. Um, we all have a life history and story, and Julie Clam has written um, a memoir which has in common with Sloan and with Keith, I think, um, 
a certain sense of the sadness of life, but it doesn't start out that way. It's called, please excuse my daughter. And I, as I said, I would like to know what, what, what you were being excused for when you began in this uh, march um, to adulthood. <laughs> well, um, it's, please excuse my daughter is sort of about my, mo I think my mother's wish to keep all discomfort from her children. And um, if she could excuse you from math for life, you know, excuse, excuse you from having to do anything that would, that might be uncomfortable. Um, you know, she's still, she's still like that. She's like that with my daughter. My daughter is uh, in pre-K and the teacher was telling her about how, uh, I'm telling my mother how great Violet is because Violet knows the alphabet independent of the ABC song. And I said, she does, but she confuses M and N. And my mother said, well, why do they put them so close together? She's like ready to call the, you know, alphabet commission, right. alphabet Sharpton. And um, she, she wants us all to, you know, let's like, let's not have pain here, you know. But then you met life in a big way head on as you got older. And it was something of a surprise, I think it's sure. fair to say. Yeah, well, um, the surprise was that my mother was not going to be able to write excuse notes for me as I went through life, and I have to take jobs, and if a job doesn't work out, they expect you to get another job after that. Mm -hmm. You know, even though you clearly had an unpleasant experience, let's, let's say we tried it and it didn't work. Um, you know, and then, you know, the more, you know, the older you get, the more things happen to you, and you know, I think I was very lucky in my childhood that I wasn't exposed to illness and death and, you know, it's some luck and it changed, you know. It, it did change. It changed in a very big way. Mm -hmm. One of the main, I think the, maybe the way this book started out was the story of um, Joe. Is that right? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's like this couple chapters in, but yeah, that's the but story. But wasn't that the kind... Didn't you tell that story to someone and they... Oh, that's how the book started? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It is like out of fiction. How on earth did you get involved with this guy? Well, um, Joe was an ex-convict bank robber mafioso. Um, and what I'd always been looking for. I actually I, I, love movies. And he was... Ex it was like meeting somebody out of... I mean, he was like Al Pacino, you know in The Godfather. No, because he was kind of good in that. <laughs> he was like somebody bad, Fredo. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, um, I, I just was fascinated by, I mean, t my life experience was zilch. This guy had gone to prison at 17. He'd robbed 29 banks in a summer with his little group of friends. Uh, he'd had, you know, they stole the mafia guys in their Brooklyn neighborhood's cars and got told to stop doing it. like everything that happened you know he would he would talk about having any number of children at a time and and you know it was it was you know it was it was just to me I just it was like this has got to be this story I, I love this story <laughs> I mean I, I did you think of it as material at the time no I did I, you did I did but I didn't think I really didn't think I'd ever do anything with it um, I think I but I took notes, you know, I mean, um, yeah. I, uh, I took notes a, a lot because I just said, I've got to remember the way he said this, right. you know. Never sit down with a writer. <laughs> Never go to bed with a writer unless, <laughs> unless right. you want to find yourself between other covers. Exactly. Um, well, that was, that, was his, that was what he told me. Um, in, rather than paying me back all the money he owed me, I had these great stories that I could make uh, money from. And, you know. <laughs> it, you 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 have a wonderful way with aphorism, aphorisms, however you say that word, mm -hmm. as does Sloan, as does Keith, actually. Um, one of them is something about, um, get it, I think you say something like, I, it, was, it, it seemed odd that you were being thrown out of a hospital for being sick, <laughs> which is a terrifically good line when you right. just run across it as you read it. Right. What was, that what, was my, um, my, uh, my boyfriend at the time. Um, was in the hospital. Uh, we um, had gotten back from a trip, and um, it was kind of a bad few weeks. Uh, we, my parents took us to Barbados. Um, right before I went, I found out that I was pregnant, and we'd been dating for not that long, and 
I was not going to. I was on this vacation waiting to come back and have an abortion, which is not a happy uh, thing. At the same time, Paul, my, my now husband, was in like the throes of becoming like horrifically diabetic. He was very close to going into a diabetic coma. So he went to, um, uh, went to get a checkup and they checked him into the hospital. He was in the emergency room and I was sick after my uh, procedure and I dragged myself to the hospital. I was throwing, <laughs> throwing up the whole way there and threw up in the hospital and they said, I think you better leave. Right. <laughs> And That's was, just what you want from the doctor. Exactly. Like, oh, you're sick. You know what? Come back when you're well. You know, we don't want people throwing up who aren't admitted. You know, that's basically what it is. We didn't get your insurance card. It, try to keep it down. So. so some of these things that you're talking about are the, are the ways in which reality, and I have to say they are thick and fast, and my heart went out to you on many occasions. Uh, reality it ends a spoiled childhood in some ways. It kind of fetch yeah. up against it. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there's any, is there anything in your book that you can say that you're sorry is in it? There's nothing I'm sorry about. I, um, I had a, um, people close to me read, read it beforehand and my mother asked for me to take one word out, which I did, and... Um, <laughs> one really you wants to know. You have to, to tell know. us the right. <laughs> one really wants to know. Well, if I tell you then just give you it can curse on the show it's not <laughs> it's not a, it's <laughs> not a, <laughs> your mom would be happy yeah no she wouldn't be never mind she, I yeah so far be it from um, us it was to actually it, it, it wasn't important <laughs> but it was important to her is there any princess left in you well um i still think of myself you know very princess like i don't do anything princess like mm -hmm. i st i the princess comes out when i say what the heck well, I'm doing here? You know, I'm walking, you know, two dogs, and I have this screaming kid. You know, I should have a staff. You know, I should, <laughs> you know, so I should have somebody to pick up the crap. <laughs> um, but, you know, it just didn't go that right. way. And, and I'm very happy it didn't. It's, it's a much more fulfilling uh, life. <laughs> the, um, the, I just want to read a couple of things oh, that I, sure. very short things. Um, the, this is one of the reasons I liked your book so much. It was 11 a.m. He'd have approximately six hours to travel 20 minutes. In Florida, this is known as cutting it close. <laughs> this is very funny. Uh, and then in your neighborhood, uh, you, there were uh, haves and have mores, right. as you put it. Right. Which were you? May I ask it to uh, be rude? W w did you have more? When I was growing up? Yeah. Uh, we were have mores. You were. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the same question I asked before, um, this is a memoir, mm -hmm. um, but you're still, to me at least, very young. Uh, did, what led, I mean, when did you think you might do this and what was the sort of impetus for it? Um, you know, I actually, you know, had like a light bulb moment where I thought, you know, somebody else must be able to relate to this story. And, you know, um, my incredible agent, Esther Newberg, and I talked on the phone and she said, this is more, this is more than a magazine article. This is a book. And I think it's a memoir. And I was like, you know, like most people thinking a memoir should be written by somebody like Frank McCourt, not Julie Clam. Um, but I didn't have Frank McCourt uh, and I had me, so. Right. right. <laughs> and you had your Frank McCourt moments, but a little bit later on. I mean, yeah. the sense of difficulty and challenges. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of backwards. Caridwin Dovey, I have that name right. Yeah. It's what origin? It's Welsh, actually. It's Welsh. Yeah. That's what I was guessing. Yeah. I just won yeah. a bet. My dad way. read um, <laughs> a Welsh book, How Green Was My Valley, mm -hmm. by Richard Llewellyn, and one of the protagonists is called Caridwin. So. But you're not Welsh in... I think a long time ago, when my family first came over from Wales to South Africa, they were, because Dovey is also Welsh. Mm -hmm. But we have no idea who they were. I'm sure they were drunkards and That's <laughs> <laughs> um, always a good provenance. Yeah. I mean. um, like Keith's book in some way, your novel talks about the sort of, I should say that it's a, it's a novel about a coup in a nameless country and all the characters are nameless. They're identified in other ways. How did you arrive? Can you talk a little bit about the structure and what you had in mind when you decided to kind of make it anonymous? 
Yeah, I think it came, I mean, it's a fable, so it's meant to get at these ideas more abstractly. But I think the reason for picking that form was um, my own insecurity in having moved back to South Africa after 10 years not living in the country. And I'd gone back to Cape Town and um, started working on this book. And I just remember feeling that I had no right to write in that context, you know, in a post-apartheid South Africa. Um, the the tree scene is quite fraught with issues of representation and who can say what and legitimate ones I think um, and so having moved around so much and sort of skimmed the surface of so many cultures but never really been embedded in any particular one um, I couldn't give the kind of thick description that I think good fiction is is based on and um, so this form actually felt like a precondition for being able to write and to be so able to write unselfconsciously in that context it was almost a political decision in a way, mm. or at least a social one. You needed not to anchor it somewhere. You didn't feel quite qualified or quite in the right place to do it. Yeah. How did you do the structure consists of three first person narratives and then three more first person narratives or points of view. The second three are related to the first three. The mm -hmm. first three are the president's barber, the president's chef, and the president's portraitist. Right and the th next three are related to them. Yeah. I want to know technically how you did that. That is to say, did you have an outline? Um, I didn't. I knew where it had to end. I found if I planned it out too much day to day, I didn't want to do the actual writing. And I think um, Javier Marias, the Spanish novelist, mm -hmm. puts it really well. He says he always has a compass but not a map. So you kind of know the direction you're going. But it took the joy out of the Right. The, the mystery of the daily grind, um, if I did plan it. But, I mean, it was a conscious decision to do, tell the, the men's, have the men's voices and then the women's voices um, in response. And I think at that level, I'm trying to get at something about, you know, power being both political and personal. And without the women's voices, you wouldn't get the sense of a cycle of violence that's set in motion. Right. And that's what the title's meant to signify, as a kind of chorus of voices. Um, the, 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 you said that, it was meant to be political and personal, and I have to say mm -hmm. I read it in the long run without giving too much away, especially since there's a kind of quite a surprise at the end, um, as being almost entirely personal. Does that make any sense to you at all? Um, I guess I take it as a compliment. I mean, in a way, I think it's hard to identify with these characters. You know, it's a country you don't know where you are, and so I, I think in that sense, it put more pressure on the language. It had to really tether the reader. Um, and give them their bearings. And but but the, the plot, which, is, mm. which has to do with the progress of the coup, mm -hmm. is told in a way that seems to make the actual political aspect of the coup less and less important. Yeah. Well, it's not an allegory, right? There's no real life reference. So I think in that sense, working at the level of a fable, it is more abstract and more personal. I meant to also talk to you about the amazing physical detail. There's a lot of somewhat a repugnant imagery yeah. in tubes of paint like slugs, mm -hmm. for instance, you know, they're half used. Mm -hmm. And when the barber is shaving somebody, I can't remember who, he sees that there's a very loving description of the way the little hairs come off in the shaving cream and stuff. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that from being an anthropologist? Or is it just from being a human being mm. sort of <laughs> a little obsessed Are you with a human such thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that was actually a response to the abstraction of the non geographical ah. place setting. Mm. So that the only way you really identify with these people is at a haptic level. So perhaps yep. you don't know where they are, but you know maybe your body works in very similar ways. And so that description of those physical processes mm. and the minutiae of bodily functions, which right. perhaps veers towards the scatological too many times, is the only, <laughs> you know, never too many. Never too many. <laughs> as, you know, <laughs> as your <laughs> first chapter was. Yeah. Well, also involved, they're also all involved in very physical, you know, they're the chefs right. and the Yeah, the laying on of hands, right? Mm -hmm. So they're non-political um, workers for the president. There were pa a lot of passages about aging, um, and it bothered me because I knew you were so young, <laughs> and I wondered, how does she know this? Um, <laughs> I know this, but how does she know this? Uh, uh, on, yeah, and when his chef is talking, one of, the, one of the characters is the president's chef, and they're all in prison. They, the first three are in prison, and they're all trying to figure out um, what their relationship, what's going to happen to them, 
and they're beginning to talk to each other and learn more about each other. But the chef says, um, it's not the wrinkles, it's things you're never told to expect. Having to piss five times a night, discovering that your calf muscles are disintegrating against your will, leaving you bandy-legged, watching the spider veins cast their purple webs across the backs of your knees, and so on. How do you know that? How do you know that? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm trained as an anthropologist, so I guess I'm pretty good at observing things. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard my father go to the toilet five times <laughs> the night. And I'm sure your father would be very pleased <laughs> to know I'm delighted, home, really, that I mentioned that. that. Yeah, um, I've seen my grandparents, you know, wake right. up with their eyes sealed shut because their tear ducts aren't working. But at a, at a deeper level, this is the human condition, right? I mean, we're the only species that's aware of our death. And so I'm, I think, you know, that awareness of, of aging is, we wouldn't be human if we didn't have it. There's, a, there's another writer, Allegra Goodman, I don't know if you know who she is, mm -hmm. um, very good novelist, who has a similar um, talent for imagining middle age uh, at, at, a, at a very young age, and I was, I'm just impressed. I mean, your answer mm -hmm. is fine, but I'm still impressed by the, by the gift and somewhat annoyed at how, um, how much, how good imagination you have. The irony is that in, in the book it all seems like a very depressing process, but my sense is that it's actually a very well-kept secret that aging is a wonderful thing, and, you know, our culture is so youth-obsessed and youth-focused and um, I mean, we all here. I certainly, all young I and, you certainly know, but, hope you're right. <laughs> right, but you know, I, I, I think there's something, there's something really um, liberating about it. Well, that's to, my sense. At to this go back, end of the to go back to the comparison between Keith's book and your book, one of which seems sort of semi-autobiographical, but turns out to be made up. Yours seems entirely allegorical and mythic, but there is a similarity between the two which is that personal lives tend, to, the way I read the books, tend to, uh, even Keith's book, tend to sub supersede um, political life. That is, the people involved in this coup, which seems to be heading in a certain direction and seems to have personal relationships that begin to kind of almost foul up your own architecture. And it's almost as if the personal stories it, it looks like an allegory, and then suddenly you realize these people are related to each other in certain ways. So I'm just wondering, do you think, it, it, do you, th both of them made me feel a little bit at, at a certain stage of my own life that mm. there was no, not much hope that things were going to change. Mm. I mean, it's an interesting question because, I mean, I grew up in apartheid South Africa and actually came of age right when a new dispensation was coming in. So um, having lived through that, having seen how in these moments of dislocation there's incredible opportunity for you know, rebirth of new orders and sort of seen it personally, I'm surprised at myself that this came out in such a pessimistic and almost nihilistic way. And now, unfortunately, if you follow South African politics, perhaps that is coming to, you know, um, the circle is really going to come back yeah. because um, we have a new... Um, He'll probably be the new president by next year, Jacob Zuma, and he's a terrifying character politically. But um, I think it's also the, the, the nature of, of life in a globalized world um, that we've lost sight of the structures within which we live, that we are so alienated, not just from you know, the means of production now, but from everything. And um, you know, one of my interests is, is climate change adaptation, and for me, it, that's really getting us to start thinking and behaving globally for perhaps the first time in a, in a globalized world. So it's that sense that, you know, we're all complicit in these myriad of things every single day that we do, and yet those things have become invisible to us. You use the term means of production. You, you slip that in. I think that's a good Marxist term, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> just wonder, wonder, I wonder, I, I can't help wondering about the politics of everybody here, especially at this moment in the political season, but maybe it's better to stick with the books for a while. <laughs> you used to write much shorter things, that is to say pop-up videos. Right. And I need to ask you, what was the best pop-up video, best pop-up you ever did? Can um, you remember? Let me see. The best 
Uh, the best pop, well, I, I, it actually wasn't a funny one, um, but it was in the, uh, well, well, I did the, um, the Nirvana, you know, that Nirvana video, um, come as, you, oh, I did a few of their, their videos, but the, the thing that I was the most proud of was there was an in excess video where um, Michael Hutchins, who's now deceased, and there's a lot of questions about how he died, he's, there's a scene where he's like doing the Bob Dylan flipping the, the cards from, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, like losing the name of the movie. But, um, uh, and all, they're all words with eight at the end. And, and supposedly Michael Hut Hutchins died of autoerotic asphyxiation. So I got asphyxi eight at that time to work really well. Perfect. VH1 pulled it. Right. And then you know you did your job. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you win an Emmy? I was nominated. Okay. We never won any. Okay. We were nominated a lot. We lost um, the year that I was, um, up, we lost against the Macy's Parade that bonked the woman on the head, almost oh. killed her. Oh. Yes. That's in the book, I yes. think. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so death beat you out, basically. And, yeah, I mean, they, they won an Emmy, yeah. and we, you know. It was Michael's revenge. Why are you, right. why are you all <laughs> writing books? Why aren't you, I mean, aren't, don't you consider them like, you're all young. Uh, aren't they like out of fashion? Are they still iconic? I mean, why aren't you blogging? Why aren't you? What is, does this still mean something to you? Evidently it does. It's the yeah. gold standard, right? I still mean, is? Yeah, definitely. Really? I think so. Do you, do you keep a blog? No. No. Keith, you do. No. 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 I do. You do. No. No. I don't, but you. My blog. Your is blog is about part of your website, right? Is part to, is because I feel a feeling we're about to enter down a road of sort of flogging blogs, and I think that you're exempt from just having a blog. Yeah, it's not like I, I never I didn't have a blog before I had a website. Thank you. I just, I just the I publicist in you pulled <laughs> that. Um, wouldn't look. So well, it's an. I mean, it's an. It's a. It's an interesting question, um, whether the book still exists as a cultural object. I mean, I think, I think it does. To me, it does. And, but in a way, it's like we were raised, you know, we were raised a little while ago uh, before some of these things happened. So our minds are formed. Maybe not you. <laughs> well, but, I, think, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying is it's the next generation that it'll That's be really question. interesting to yeah. watch. Like your or daughter's the, the generation. The, the, the whole know. Kindle thing I find very terrifying. Um, really? I do. I just feel like, but I mean, you know, I was talking to somebody who um, who works in the um, who works in the internet business, and he said, "Who would have thought that you would not be buying albums anymore? You'd just be downloading songs." And I was, you know, it, it's very scary. But I think the thing about um, books, which are different than, yeah, I mean, for me, for writing television, and I had written screenplays is that a book actually happens. If you sell your proposal, you know, <laughs> you actually have a book. You know, if you sell your script, you know, you might have a paycheck and, you know, um, you know, or TV show, you, it may never see the light of day. There's something so satisfying about actually two years ago saying that you're gonna do this and then you have this thing in your hand and forever it will exist. On remainder tables or <laughs> wherever, but somewhere. Right, in your parents' bookshelf, <laughs> parents, right. Violet's bookshelf, <laughs> right, perhaps. Right, right. Although she, I hope she doesn't read it too early. I have to say, no, I, not too much. I, not too much. Danger, Kindle is, is Kindle is terrifically fascinating. I'm sure it'll come up in other conversations mm -hmm. that I have with writers. Um, you've all been really good talking heads, so I want to thank you for joining us on. Um, on title page, and and because you've been good good talking heads, I'm going to give you each a little present of candid silent heads, oh, wow, so that you can nice. kind of contemplate them. And, and <laughs> this you. is a book <laughs> called American Photo Booth. Wow. It's by uh, collected by Naki Goranin, if I have the pronunciation right, and they're they're wonderful. Oh. They they hark back to a time that probably Keith would. Um, and I would, would miss a lot. In the, in the olden days when things were real and authentic. Thank you. And Sloan, because, uh -oh. because you were disappointed once, I decided that I would give you and not disappoint you this time. You're the first, I've, I've had threats, you're the first one to actually. <laughs> this is a cake, so Thank you. you can't go away from here and say I was told there'd be cake. I was. So, and 
<laughs> Good. Thank you all for joining. I'm very excited. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you. And thanks for joining us on Title Page. I hope you can be part of our conversation online. And no matter what else you do, keep reading.